Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Marjorie O'Toole and I'm the director of the Historical Society. And it is my great pleasure tonight to welcome Janet Lyle as our speaker. Janet is a dear friend of the Historical Society. Um, 10 years ago, wrote her first book for us, The History of Little Compton, First Light Sakonet, followed two years later by A Home by the Sea from 1820 to 1950. So Janet devoted about four years of her life uh, giving, <laughs> maybe not full-time, but part-time at least, um, giving the Historical Society those two beautiful, absolutely readable, understandable, um, comprehensive histories of Little Compton. And it was my pleasure to work with her on those projects. Um, she is never more than a phone call or an email away when we need her. And when we asked if she'd speak this, this season, she agreed. Um, and we are delighted. Um, she is going to, and I will let her tell you more about who she's going to speak about, but a truly remarkable group of young women from early 19th century Little Compton. So Janet, thank you very much. And we just need to make sure Janet's unmuted. Mm -hmm. And Janet. Yes, I'm, un I'm unmuted. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Oh, hello, everybody. This is totally weird for me, but I'm so happy to see all your faces there. And uh, I love this project that I worked on in order to present this talk. And um, I, I hope it, it comes off as well as, as I, I think it may. Um, I wanted to say that there's a video at the end of this talk that it runs. It's a Ken Burns video that runs about six minutes. And I hope everyone will stay and, and listen to that, which ends, it ends the talk in such a wonderful, wonderful way um, and says things that I um, am gonna be saying in my, my talk, but, but better in a way. So stick around for that. And of course, I'd be delighted to ask, answer questions afterwards too. All right, the woman we're looking at right here is Abby Maria Wilbur. And in December of 1843, this little Compton farm wife created a neighborhood sensation with an act that has echoed down through the centuries in little Compton lore. Not yet, Roger. <laughs> she rode in a one horse cottage carriage uh, with Frederick Douglass, the escaped slave and abolitionist speaker against slavery, down West Main Road from her house near the Swamp Road corner, and she went then down Meeting House Lane with this carriage and with Frederick Douglass to the Methodist Church on the Common, where he was, had been invited to speak. Um, this story of this ride is one of the most oft-repeated anecdotes in Little Compton's 19th century history, and it's no wonder because it is a charmer. Frederick Douglass was 25 years old, Strikingly handsome at six feet tall, 200 pounds. He was just back from six months of a circuit ride to meeting halls throughout the Eastern and mid Midwestern states. Though um, the small towns that he spoke in were not always very happy to have him. In fact, he'd been clobbered a number of times and attacked by mobs, stoned and beaten with um, sticks. And in, in one that happened in the summer, actually probably in the fall before he visited Little Compton, his hand had been broken uh, severely by one of these mob attacks. Uh, and he arrived uh, with a bandage, I think it must have been, on his hand. Um, we don't know if this is the reason that Abby Maria Wilbur perhaps was at the reins of the carriage uh, and not someone else, but uh, down they went and the story uh, has it that B.F. Wilbur, who was Abby Maria's husband, Benjamin Franklin Wilbur I, uh, uh, walked behind the carriage because it only had two seats, and that this caused a snicker in the community, um, if not um, actual, you know, amazement, to have a man walking behind this carriage that carried a black man and his wife. It's sort of a comical story, is the way it's been told through the years, I think, 
Um, you know, B.F. Wilbur is the main, you know, thing that you think about. He, why was he walking back there, that silly man? He clearly, you know, he, his wife was clearly a browbeater. Something was wrong with her. Uh, a little bit of that in the story, a cartoon-like. So Douglas apparently spoke that evening at the Methodist Church, and that sits still on the commons. It's, in case you um, haven't realized it, it's the old Methodist Church is the Odd Fellows Hall now, which later became um, uh, the center for the American Legion and Grange operations go on there now. And he was invited back afterward to spend the night at the B.F. Wilbur home, once again at the invitation of Abby Maria Wilbur. And there she gave him in the house the master bedroom, according to relatives who still live in the house uh, and um, love this story. It's become a family story. They know which house it was that Frederick Douglass was there. They call him the great man. And apparently he felt so at home in the house that he actually pared his fingernails sometime during the night. And the family, when he had left the next morning, found a little pile of Frederick Douglass's fingernails sitting beside his bed on the bedside table. Um, of course, the next question is, did we save those fin fingernails? Are they somewhere in the attic of the house? Um, and the answer is, we have no idea where the fingernails gone. But I think the family took it to mean that he was comfortable, he liked being there. So that's the story, um, a sort of fun story, a little anecdotal, but you know, really cute kind of. Um, and how was it that Douglas actually did come to Little Compton? It's interesting to dig a little deeper. Well, Abby Maria Wilbur, happened to be vice president of an organization that had been meeting in private homes in Little Compton for some time. It was called the Little Compton Female Anti-Slavery Society, and it was a group of about 25 women, many about the same age, quite young, as Douglas was in 1843. And those who had, they had begun to react to some of the terrible stories that were coming up from the South about slave brutality. This was um, actually, even a decade earlier, they had begun to respond in the 1830s, which is what, probably when they first gathered. Um, most of these women lived on the main thoroughfare at the time of West Main Road. And you can see it um, going right up there. You can see uh, Queen of Washock Swamp, and you see all those houses. There, it's, it's, you suddenly realize that it was, the, um, it was sort of the, the main thoroughfare, the main place where people lived in private homes in Little Compton in the 1830s, houses all along there. Uh, and um, of course, they were, um, the, they, they were mostly the wives and the daughters of landowning families who lived, they were big farms in that area, uh, all along the Sakonnet River, that fantastic black, beautiful farmland that grew um, very richly products that, that made the, the farmers of Little Compton fairly well off. And these women, um, although they were farm wives, uh, were, were pretty well healed. They, they, had, um, they were the mistresses of large farms, as were their husbands. They were well educated for their time and they were articulate um, and aware of events that were happening in Boston and Providence and even Washington, D.C through newspapers and pamphlets that made their way into their homes. And their husbands and fathers were farmers, but they, they liked politics. They talked about politics. And in the case of Sarah Sol Wilbur, um, her father talked about state and national politics because he was the famous governor, Isaac Wilbur. But their main interest was in running the farms uh, and overseeing their farm products, their laborers, uh, they um, made sure that the fields were worked properly, that they got down to the shore to gather their seaweed, all, all those stories that we've heard so often. The farms and the industry of the farms was their, mo was their main interest. Very interestingly, many of the families that these women in the anti-slavery society um, were members of had owned slaves in the 17th century. Um, the Gray family, the Bailey family, the Wilbers had all purchased slaves back then when they were trying to wrestle their farms into productive acreage. And Blacks still lived and worked in the Little Compton community at this time, though most were free. In fact, I think all were free at this time. Um, the last 
last black um, servant, the last black slave, I think, um, was given her freedom um, in, what was her, Deborah Hilliard, I think her name was, was given her freedom in 1816. And this was due to Rhode Island's 1784 Gradual Emancipation Act, which said that slaves born after 1784, or those who were enslaved, um, could have their freedom, were free, um, after they served um, a, a, a short time, um, in the case of the men, 20 years, in the case of women, 18 years, of indentured service. So they had, were trans, they were sort of trans, um, they became, uh, you know, indentured servants and, and lived by those rules. And there were very likely free black servants living in Abbe Maria's home and in the homes of the other women of the anti-slavery society who would have witnessed the arrival of Frederick Douglass coming down to her house. Well, it's hard for us in the 20th and 21st century to see how strange it was for women be getting together to discuss a topic as explosive as slavery, and even more, to try to take action on it. Their roles in society back in the 1830s were so separate from the men and their families. Women in Little Compton did not travel out of town for most part. They did not attend political meetings at the commons. They didn't talk with men over backyard fences or about politics of any kind. They did not raise their voices at the dinner table or disagree with their husbands. They did not vote and they did not own property. Their job was the house, the children, the laundry, the baking, cooking for the farm crews as well as their own families. And some had help, but some did not. They went to church and were expected and expected it of themselves to uphold the moral and social codes of the day. Men could stray and sin. Women obeyed their husbands. And most, most importantly, these women did not speak out in public, not a peep. And so they met and talked among themselves in private places in their own homes, usually when the men were out at work. Uh, sewing circles, prayer meetings were places that you could meet and speak with other women without men around. Whether the Little Compton Female Anti-Slavery Society started as a sewing circle, as many other anti-female societies, anti-slavery societies did at this time, and there were a number of them throughout New England, or whether some other secular group or religious group became um, the meeting point in the beginning, we can't be sure, but it had started to gather steam, this group, by the early 1830s, and to become a place in these sewing circles um, that was receptive to the stories that were beginning to come up out of the South about the enslaved people there. And things were certainly heating up in the news outside of Little Compton. In New Bedford at this time, the fiery abolitionist, William Lloyd Garrison was publishing his scandalous newspaper, The Liberator. Uh, he founded this in 1831. Uh, there it is, The Liberator. The most horrible um, front headline there across of, of the pictures across the top showing every dreadful thing happening already. He was fully aware. Uh, Garrison was, a, was an amazing, well, amazing fellow. And he was fully aware very, very early on, early on that the press could bring about change that mere speakers and circuit writers could not. So in it, he reported all sorts of barbaric stories about the slave trade and the ruthless treatment of men and women enslaved in the Southern plantations. And by 1834, uh, he had 2000 subscribers of whom, this is very interesting, three quarters were blacks. And many of them lived in New Bedford. And actually Charles Wilbur, who was Sarah Sol Wilbur's husband, uh, subscribed to this, or maybe it was Sarah Sol Wilbur herself, who knows, but um, we have the, in the archives of the Historical Society a check that Charles Wilbur wrote to the Liberator, um, a subscription check for, uh, for the newspaper. He got it on a regular basis. One of the things that Garrison did, uh, most importantly, and throughout all of his life and his speaking, uh, fiery speaking all around, was to um, appeal directly to women. He felt very early that they were a powerful source of support. Um, they could ask their husbands to uh, 
subscribe to the Liberator, and they could also nudge their husbands to um, go to committee meetings. He felt and that the women were a moral center that he could play with in his uh, newspapers that uh, who would have uh, make it make a difference um, and persuade larger numbers of families, family people about his views on the causes of uh, all the scandals and the horrors that were happening uh, in the South, especially. So he appealed directly to women in many of his speeches in New Bedford, Providence, New York and Boston, he so outraged a group of men that uh, he was set upon and um, very came very close to being um, strung up, hung. They actually had built a gall gallows and were dragging him toward it when a few of his own cohort rescuers um, interceded and, um, and kidnapped him back and brought him back to safety. Uh, this is something, probably a story that um, the women in the Little Compton history, in the anti-slavery uh, society would have heard. Uh, let's see. There was someone else who also had a huge effect, I think, on this society that was um, beginning to gather in the 1830s, and that was the wonderful Elizabeth Buffum Chase, the Quaker Rhode Island, Rhode Island Quaker woman who uh, spoke out um, in a way that other women didn't dare to very often. Not loudly, you understand. Um, her husband did a lot of the work of speaking, but she was there as a moral force behind him. And she also uh, ran a, an underground railroad from her, her home um, outside of Fall River. And she was the one who really started the Fall River anti-slavery, female anti-slavery group that became um, of such interest to the women in Little Compton. In fact, um, Sarah Sol Wilbur, who was president of the Little Compton Anti-Slavery Society, here is her vice president. These are our two heroes, Sarah Sol Wilbur on the right and Abby Maria Wilbur on the left, president and vice president. Um, Sarah Sol Wilbur was only two years older than Buffum Chase, and they had met um, early on in this activist, these activist 1830s probably at one of the conventions that Garrison spoke there. And years later, in fact, Sarah remembered this time in her diary. She wrote, Sarah Sol Wilbur, as many of you know, wrote um, an amazing um, series of entries towards the end of her life that told even a little bit, quite a lot about her life um, when she had been a, uh, an activist during anti-slavery days. She, um, she said that like Buffum, she was a strong Garrisonian, and that was a strong word to use. The Garrisonians believed in immediate emancipation. None of this gradual stuff, you know, they, they slaves needed to be emancipated at right now, and um, action needed to be taken right now to promote this and also to support the families and the lives of uh, the men and women who were in the community who had been slaves. So both she and Abby Maria thought of themselves as really Garrisonians, more rag radical than most, and um, probably more radical than many other women in their group. And they were whispered about in the community. People thought they were crazy. They thought they were uh, you know, a threat, threat to social order. Um, they, the two had married cousins, they were very close. And after 1827, when they both married in the same year, within months of each other, they lived in the same house, which was the B.F. Wilbur house, where um, Abby, in fact, brought uh, Frederick Douglass when she, when she brought him home after the um, Methodist church. And it's probably here in this large house, B.F. Wilbur's house was among the larger houses uh, in the Little Compton community in that day, that these um, early feminist anti-slavery society meetings took place, the, the ones in Little Compton. So what did the women talk about? And interestingly enough, mostly what they talked about was family, just what you would think that women would talk about. They talked about the separations that the slave families endured. They talked about the women who lost their children, and that their children dragged off on the auction block. Um, and they talked about um, the children themselves who were, who were slaves in slavery. They, uh, they hated that part of slavery, most of all. Uh, they, they wanted to do something about it. And 
part of the reason why I think was that so many of these women had lost children themselves. This was a time of, um, of uh, high death rates among young children in, um, in the, in the um, 1830s. This is um, before the Civil War, before there was really, there were really very many doctors around or anything was known about medicine. And children died in droves. They died in infancy. They died at two or three days. They died, you know, after you began to love them at six months. They died after two or three years. It was heartbreaking, and it's heartbreaking to go through B.F. Wilbur's families, uh, that, um, his, his genealogies, and to see the dates uh, of these children, um, of the parents who time after time tried again and lost their children over and over, sometimes named their children the same name three or four times. Let's see, I have a note here that um, Simeon Bailey, who was married to Sarah Coe around this time, um, lost seven children in a very short space of time. He lost twin girls first. He lost a boy at two years old. He lost Sarah, who came next at three days. These are sequential children. He lost another Sarah at one day and a third Sarah at one day. And finally, an, a boy, Simeon, he lost this boy as well, uh, as Sarah Coe did as well, too. So um, deaths were, um, were something that happened. And even though they happened frequently, they were no less um, uh, horrifying and frightening. Uh, and, um, and women mourned. And I think this is one of the reasons that this aspect of slavery, the auction block where young, young babies were grabbed and taken away from their mothers, especially um, affected women who were in a situation like this anti-slavery league. So uh, I, must, I should also say that Elizabeth Waltham Chase had lost her first five children. All of them died over a period of about seven years, between, they were between, between the ages of two and nine years old. She began to wonder about herself, this Quaker mother, if she'd done something wrong. Three of them died of scarlet fever, um, and we don't know what the other two died of. Sarah Sol Wilbur, who was so close with Elizabeth Buffum Chase, lost her first child, Elizabeth, as an infant daughter. So um, there, was, there was this great sympathy that naturally flowed uh, so partly through these neighborhood gatherings and partly through uh, perhaps classes that they took at the Methodist Church. The Methodists were very strong anti slavers at this time. Um, these women began to gather around and they all lived around this section of Swamp Road that we just showed you. And they also, we know their names. This is what's really fun because the archives of the Little Compton Historical Society, brilliant as it is, has a document which shows us on the right-hand side, the names of all the women who were members of the uh, Little Compton Female Anti-Slavery Society. Uh, and on the right, on the left are their husbands uh, also signing. They were members of a slavery society that, um, I, I'm not sure it really, I guess they gave it a name, the, the Slavery Society of Little Compton or something, but they were, they were not so organized as these women on the right. Uh, and um, I'll talk about that in a little bit later. But um, here, here are some of the people, we can see their names and I can't show you their pictures, but there are no real photographs of women of, of, at this time. It was just too early, the 1830s and early 1840s. But I can show you their houses and they are houses that everyone drives by in Little Compton every day. Uh, this is the B.F. Wilbur house, in fact, taken a little bit later uh, in the century. And this is where Abby Maria, who married B.F. Wilbur at the age of 16, came to live with um, this older husband of hers. He was 11 years older. Uh, and she, um, she was very, a very fierce, even as a young woman, um, very articulate. Um, the, the Wilbur family describes her um, the word that has come down that she was known as Mrs. Clean in the, in, the, in the family lore because she always was so interested in keeping the dirt of the farm out of her kitchen, out of her house. And the word was that she, um, 
that her husband, B.F. Wilbur, spent most of his time keeping away from the sweep of her broom. That is, that's the family lore that has come down. Sarah Sol Wilbur was also strong-willed, and she also was living in this house for those 10 years with uh, her cousin. Uh, they, had married, um, they had married distant cousins, probably third cousins. I can never quite figure it out. The tangle of um, genealogical names is just in the Wilbur section of the B.F. Franklin, the Benjamin Franklin um, genealogies. It just um, you know, makes your eyes cross. So I, I never have really figured out exactly how they were related. But um, they, they lived there. And also, um, Sarah Sol Wilbur, although she was strong-willed and also very proud of her, her, her father, the governor, um, and, and of her Wilbur heritage, um, she, was, she was very much in love with the man she married, Charles Wilbur. Um, she, um, she, she talks often in her diary about how they met as young lovers, and um, how they used to um, you know, be together as young people. And those were times she always remembered and, and longed for. So a soft heart, Sarah Sol Wilbur, even, as though she, even though she was so, so bright and such, had such a tongue herself, in fact. So then there was the Deacon Thomas Burgess house. This is the house that some of you will recognize just down on the west side of West Main Road, across from Swamp Road, uh, and I don't know who lives there now, but um, it was it belonged in those days to Ruth Burgess and Deacon Thomas. This was a second marriage that had brought two families together. There were a lot of children, many daughters, living in this house with with Ruth Burgess, were her daughters um, Anne, Sarah, Abigail, Sally. Many of them were members of this society. And they were all still quite young, unmarried. There was also another person in this household who you'll find more recognizable. And she was young, Ruth Burgess, who would, 10 years later, marry George Burley, the long-haired, transcendental circuit rider who came into town and um, fell in love with her and went to live at Owl's Nest across the street. And their child was... Sidney Burley, who became the famous painter in Compton. Another house um, that is uh, a, a place where these women, mem members of the, his of the slavery society lived was the Bailey House down on Warren's Point. This is um, a house that's right on the corner of uh, Bailey's Ledge Road and West Main, and you, you may recognize it. It's, it's, uh, this is a modern picture of it, so it's even more recognizable. Uh, thankful, thankful Bailey, married, who's married to John Barry, lived there. Bailey lived there, and she lived there with her daughter-in-law, Abigail Coe, who had grown up on the corner of Swamp and, Swamp and West Main Roads in a small cottage that was owned by Ezra Coe and his household. And she had married James James, who was Thankful's daughter. And the next house is Pamelia Bailey. Oh, the, we need the Peter B Burgess house. Do you have that? Margie, there it is. The Peter Burgess house, which is right at the top of Mary Sattel, will recognize this. It's right at the top of Taylor's Lane. Um, this was another Burgess. He was, Peter was the, the brother of um, Deacon Thomas. They were all anti-slavers. And um, he was married to Pamelia uh, and her daughters, Clorinda, 17, Lydia, 15, lived there. Uh, they all signed the document that we saw. Uh, and there was also Dorcas, who was only 10, and I think she was too young to sign this radical document. Then finally, Ezra Coe's house, Deborah Coe lived there. Um, she was married to Ezra, and Aunt Betsy Coe lived with them. All of these women knew each other from families that uh, cross-married. They knew each other because they'd been to school together. They knew each other because they had been members of a Methodist class that was meeting down on the Connet Point, and then came up the road and built a church right at the end of uh, Meeting House Lane. There were also the daughters of Nathaniel Gray. Um, this house was um, located in Musquash Hollow, which is right across from the, the Amasa Gray house. It was, it's probably Bumblebee Farm around there. Um, there was Folly, 19, Diana, 22, Harriet, 26, all signing this document. Now, the, Gray f the interesting thing about the Gray family is that they were big slaveholders during the 18th century. Um, so this was, this was something for daughters to actually, to put their, put their pens to this document, 
when um, their father, Nathaniel, for instance, was not signing. Their uncle was. So uh, I used to look at this document of women signatures back when I was writing the history of Little Compton. Um, and I used to think that these women probably signed on as adjuncts to their men. I mean, even if they were meeting in some groups privately on their own, whispering over their knitting, um, I assume that this document would have been the initiative of men. There are 28 signatures on the left, you can't see that now, but they're over here of men, and on the right are the women. And their, their signatures are fainter. Their writing is smaller. The men are, you know, right with a great flourish of everything. These are, these are women who are more careful with their signatures. And I, I took a close look at that and decided they were shy. They weren't speaking up. But then I did a little more research into this and discovered that, in fact, women like the women on this list, young women, were beginning to join anti-slavery societies in many, many other towns, small towns, farming towns, in New England. They were joining um, slavery, anti-slavery societies in Massachusetts. They were joining them in uh, uh, Vermont uh, and along the coast of New Hampshire. They were the ones, in fact, who were collecting signatures to send off to legislatures. Men didn't go about collecting signatures. Women were out there collecting signatures and, um, and trying to uh, gather more, more women to be with them and also gathering the signatures, of course, of husbands. And they, women in this group, were also sponsoring lectures, hence Frederick Douglass. They were also sewing a lot of goods, collars and cuffs, woolens and purses and sachets, all to sell because the uh, slavery societies of New Bedford needed money. And the slaves who were coming in and off the boats, the, the um, free men who were having to escape from the southern plantations needed support. So it was, a, it was a fundraiser, very often a fundraising group. And this is what the women of Little Compton also did. Um, the woman who wrote about this, uh, her, her name is Julie Roy Jeffrey, and she wrote a groundbreaking history. Um, more and more in interesting information about these invisible women in our history is coming out, and she has written one, a book called The Great Silent Army of Abolitionism. Um, about the activism of women all throughout New England and how they were never given credit for what they did. She writes, the birth of women's history has tended to focus on the small number of radical women who became feminists, while the involvement of ordinary women in the anti-slavery movement was, has been overlooked. But it was these white middle-class wives and daughters and some black women who did much of the work day to day of reform and gathering signatures and making money. For three decades, they raised money, created and distributed propaganda and signed petitions to lobby the legislatures. And they were the ones who during this period before the Civil War really kept the anti-slavery movement alive when others began to um, be not so interested anymore. And this is what I think happened in Little Compton. I think this document is a wonderful one now. I think it shows bold intent, and I think it shows a very brave act on the part of these women. Um, not speaking out, but writing down their names in, in bold, in you know, standing up and saying, putting their names down. And they're not writing Mrs. Uh, Thomas Burgess, um, like the Sakonic Golf Club book, or they're not writing Mrs. Uh, Emer you know, El Emerald Wood. They are writing Diana Wood. They are writing Abby M. Wilbur. They are writing Thankful Bailey and Ab Abigail C. Bailey, their names um, proudly. So I think this is a radical act um, and it's a wonderful thing to suddenly understand a document like this. Um, there was a lot of bad feeling against these women whose names you see before you. Uh, in the community, which was conservative, to say the least, in Little Compton. Their group was small. Um, they lived very close together and knew each other. There were many, many others on, uh, in other parts of the town who thought this was terrible behavior. They thought this was uh, not the role of women. 
to be placing their names on this document, that this, this was not the role of women to be inviting people to speak, uh, that women should be silent and be taking orders from their husband. Um, and in fact, there was an incident in town that pointed this up. Uh, it had to do with the Congregational Church, which, which as opposed to the, Methe the um, Methodist Church on the Commons, the Congregational Church on the Commons was a place of conservatism. Old, old families, older families even than these. So arriving at the Congregational Church um, to speak uh, and to become the new minister in 1839 was one Reverend Alfred Goldsmith. So uh, he was approached by several women in the congregation who in fact were members of this society. Uh, and he, one of them was in fact Ruth uh, Burgess uh, Burley, there she is. She was very young then, only 17, and her half-sister, Anne. Both, um, they, they approached him and they said they would like to hear more. Uh, Goldsmith uh, refused. He said, I'm not speaking about this. What he said was, politics has no place in the church's spiritual life. And this was not an uncommon feeling at the time. So Ruth and her half-sister, Anne, decided, half, sorry, half-sister, Sally, decided that they were going to protest by absenting themselves from the church, which of course was something that you could not do. You could not protest by not being there. In fact, if you didn't go to church, um, you could uh, you know, bring down the ire of the minister, which is exactly what happened. Reverend Goldsmith promptly excommunicated both of them, these young women. This of course caused turmoil in their families. This is the Burgess family, of course. They were, um, you know, anti-slavers. They were um, you know, protective of, of their girls and to have their women suddenly excommunicated by the church was infuriating. So uh, Thomas, uh, Reverend Dean Thomas, put, put a resolution, the Deacon Thomas Burgess put together a resolution um, and he uh, wanted the members of the church to discuss what was to go into this resolution, which was at least to discuss the problem of slavery, at least to talk about the problem of slavery. And he set the time for this meeting in eight, late 1842 in December. Well, nobody turned up. That infuriated everybody. And 17 more members of the church, the Congregational Church, suddenly resigned. And guess what? They were all related to members of the anti-slavery group. Uh, they were uh, Lydia and Ruth Burgess. They were Thankful Bailey. They were Ruth Bailey. They were Diana Coe. They were Mary Ann Taylor, who was Abby Maria's mother in that in case, in fact, many of them. And in, this caused such a ruckus that the grand deacon of all, Isaac B. Richmond, stepped in and decided to take charge. And he wrote a new resolution. I think he was actually worried that the church was going to uh, fall apart, that so many members had, um, were, you know, we're mentioning slavery and we're causing this problem in the ranks that it was, uh, it was going to break up the congregations. So he wrote a new resolution and he sided, interestingly enough, with the anti-slavers. Resolved, he said, that in the judgment of this church, this is the Congregational Church, the system of slavery or buying and selling of human beings for gain and holding them in, in involuntary servitude is a great and political moral evil offensive to God and man. And as such, we ought in all lawful ways to discountenance it and to seek its removal. Well, this was too much for Goldsmith. Immediately, the rest of the congregation fled to the side of the um, more powerful deacon. And within months, Goldsmith had resigned. Um, pastors who resigned from Little Compton churches always claimed that it was um, it was foul weather that got into their bones. That they, they were sickened by the terrible weather of Little Compton. And this is exactly what Goldsmith said. He could not carry on and he left. And in his place came the wonderful Samuel Bean, who in short order had all the women in the congregation of the Little Compton Church reading Uncle Tom's Cabin, which came out in 1850. So now we, we return to the story of Frederick Douglass. There he is looking incredibly handsome. Um, I, I began to think again about this, this kind of cartoonish idea that we had of 
Abby Maria Wilbur driving down the, in her carriage to uh, West, driving down from her house, down Meeting House Lane, um, everyone on either side looking at this and, um, and BF trailing behind. And I, I began to think that this was really not the story that should have been, that was being told by this event. In fact, uh, I think this was a very brave act by Abby Maria. Um, after all, she could have said to Frederick Douglass after the, anti, the, femi the female anti-slavery society invited him, oh, um, Frederick, I'll meet you at the church. She could have said Methodist church. She didn't have to have him to her house. She certainly did not have to drive down the road with him in the carriage. She's, she could have said also, instead of inviting him to spend the night at her house, oh, you can spend the night with your friends over on the other side of town, Frederick. You know, um, it's perfectly all right. You know, you, you don't need to come here. This is a, um, a very white community. She could have said those things, but Abby Maria and I think her soulmate and her, her um, sergeant in arms, Sarah Soul Wilbur, I think that they made this happen because this was a way that it was a bold meeting house. There were black laws, even, even in Boston at this time, that said that blacks could not ride in a carriage with whites. Blacks could not be entertained in the houses of whites. These were rules that um, had to be followed. Abby Maria knew all this, and she knew by putting on a show that she was going to make a big deal of this uh, appearance, that not only his speech was going to be important at the Methodist Church, but his appearance and her appearance together, going down Meeting House Lane and later staying in her house, was going to make a big, a big to-do about it that would uh, ricochet and echo throughout the community. And it has. Not only that, it's echoed down through time so that we still tell this story in a rather cartoonish way, but it was a very serious and brave thing for um, Abby Maria Wilbur to do. And for that, we, we really remember her very fondly. I have to say that um, Frederick Douglass paid women back in spades. He was, I think he felt uh, for them. He felt for the suffocation um, that they felt about not being able to express themselves. He had also been in that position. He had been told that he couldn't speak. He had, he had been told that um, he wasn't important. I think he always um, formed, had an alliance, had a, a heartfelt feeling for women, and he always supported the women's rights movements. Um, thereafter, in, where, throughout his long career, he didn't die until 1895, and at, even in even in his final years, he was going to women's conventions and speaking at them and supporting the women's rights, which um, amendments, which um, then became, of course, important for the suffragists. Um, he, he worked with um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. He worked with Susan B. Anthony. He was very good friends with Lucretia Mott. All of these women became his close friends and called upon him time and time again to speak for them. And, he spoke with them um, and was not afraid of being called a, you know, a, a woman's man, a, a man who was in favor of, of women's rights, um, which was not an easy uh, role to play. Not for him, not for any man, really. And that is really the end of my talk, except for this, our wonderful uh, video. I don't have sound. No sound, Marjorie. I unmuted you, Marjorie, which may have been the problem. Thank you. We'll restart the video in just a sec. Sorry, everybody. <laughs>
while we're waiting for that, if you have any questions for Janet, you can type them into the chat. And when we're done with the video, I'll ask them to her. practiced this last night. <laughs> this is a Ken, this is a short Ken Burns um, piece, a part of a larger um, a uh, series that he did on, on women's rights. Uh, and it's very evocative. Janet, while Marjorie works on that, um, someone asked, what education would these women have received? Yeah, they didn't receive much. Um, there were local schools. Everyone has heard about the little, um, you know, uh, schoolhouses that were um, at intersections throughout Little Compton. And this is the, the sorts of places that these women as girls would have gone and they wouldn't have gone for very long. They would certainly not be in school uh, when they were probably 16 or 17. Um, the bulk of their education would have come between the ages of about you know, seven and 12 or 13. But they learned to read and there was reading that matter in their houses because their, um, their families were a little more wealthy than some of the, um, the hard, the, the farmers that uh, were on the other side of town who were um, really poorer. Uh, they, they, they did okay and they were articulate and they, they met in groups that, too that discussed books. There were, there were book groups. So they were intellectually curious, these women. Um, and that was probably part of the reason why they were um, taking these Methodist classes and interested in the Methodist religion, which was a very philosophical approach to religion uh, and um, examined um, books outside the Bible to find what they had said. They examined some of the, some of, uh, the great um, literary works actually in these classes. And that, that might've been a reason also why they loved to go and and meet as Methodists, and why the, the power of the Methodist Church was such um, in was so great in the community of Little Compton. Yeah. Janet, I'm afraid I have bad news. That button that I was supposed to press to make sure I shared my audio, yeah. I didn't press it, and I think that because we're into the Zoom, I don't think I can go back and save it. It's not or, necessary. It's just it's just sort of a, um, a lovely, um, and, and you actually you can go online, any of you, um, the, the Seneca Falls Convention. It's, it's, I chose um, pictures of women who look exactly like the women of Little Compton in those days. And it tells the story of, um, of how they uh, brought this, um, this way of organizing forward, this anti-slavery organization forward to be able to speak out finally in public. Well, they were so shy. They they couldn't run they couldn't run public meetings because women were so shy of using their voices, uh, and and also it tells how Frederick Douglass helped them along on this road. So it's, it's a fun video. So any other questions? I had such fun with this project. Can you talk a little bit about what happened to the Methodist Church? How it ended up becoming the Grange? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, the Methodist Church began in 18... I can hear the audio now. Oh. You can hear the video playing? Yes. Because I can't. Okay. Um, but I think I found the button. Uh, anyway, the method... Let me answer that question. The Methodists came to town in the 1816, and they swept town from one end to the other, partly because they offered education is what I think. Um, and suddenly everybody in town wanted to join and become a Methodist. So they began in a small, um, the Sissons, uh, they began in the Sissons old farmhouse down on Sconnet Point. Uh, and then they built a, a church up opposite Meeting House, the end of Meeting House Lane behind the Brownell house. Uh, and then 
but before long they ventured to the commons and there they were with the congregational church building this um, sort of Greek revival building, which is the one that you, um, th that you saw the picture of. Um, and that was not the last church. Um, later in the century, they built what we all call the Gothic horror. They, they went crazy with their steeples and built a huge, a, a huger, even more amazing church. Uh, and that was, this was really at the height of Methodism, probably around the turn of the century. Um, and then for some reason that no one really understands, Methodism began to die out and it died and it died. And finally, that last Gothic church was standing all by itself on Pikes Peak. That's where it was built. Um, Molly Luce uh, uh, painted a painting of it going up in flames, which everyone remembers and thinks that that's what happened to it. But in fact, it didn't, it never burned. What happened was it basically caved in on itself during the 1938 hurricane and was taken down. And there's a very small rump of Methodists that was left, there were hardly any, um, joined without complaint the Congregational Minister uh, Church up the hill. And that's what happened to the Methodists. Unaccountable. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the video will play now. Would you like to do it now? Sure, that's great, yeah. So. The way that it's opened, we're going to have 30 seconds of commercial, which I've muted. So maybe if there's a 30 second question. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about the Wilbers, some of them being part of the Society of Friends and some of them not? Well, you know, that was one of the things. Um, uh, the, the Quakers, the Wilbers, the early, the early form of religion, the 1700s, and even the, you know, the early part of the 1700s, um, there were many Quakers in town, and, and some of the most, um, some of the wealthiest families were Quakers, actually. Uh, and it was something that, um, it was a little bit like Methodism. The Quakers began to, um, uh, they probably were a little too strict. They probably didn't offer enough intellectual um, food for the, pe the people of Little Compton, um, or the, the people who they want, the members who wanted to um, be, be Quakers. Their ethos, their Quaker ethos went right on. Um, and they, to be a Quaker was to be um, not self-promoting. Uh, you were not supposed to be commercial. Um, you, would, you adhered to, a, you, to a, a, a moral code that was, uh, it was fairly strict, um, but, uh, it was a code that not many people could live up to in the end. And I think that you know, the members of, of families like the Wilbers just began to stray and they went in other directions. Try it. Okay. Use your horses. Yeah, but no picture. First, we traveled quite alone. No picture. But before we had gone many miles. For, from our I side, I still. It looks like it's still in the PowerPoint, which you are direction. not in. I think maybe we better just give up on that, Janet. I'm sorry. <laughs> I love answering questions. So. <laughs> um, Helen, I think only part of your Helen Richmond Webb. I think only part of your question came through. Um, if you wanted to try to get the rest of that information in. Um, if you are interested in more information on Frederick Douglass, um, there is a group uh, who has attendees here um, that is having an event on October 9th, and I'm putting the link to that into the chat room. Oops, nope, sent that to the individual, sending it to everybody now. Um, so if you click that, um, they're doing an event on Frederick Douglass. Um, that you may be interested in. Not many questions, Janet. I think you're just too good, I guess. I think everyone is exhausted. <laughs> they want to get they want to get on to the debate. Hmm. <laughs> All right. It's interesting. I think that many, many of the women in Little Compton who are jo who joined this society had the same feelings that women today have about the um, families being separated down on the border of our country. I saw a real parallel when I was doing my research to their reactions. 
um, that, that same um, horror of families broken up, that horror of small children going without their mothers. Um, it's just a sort of, I think amongst women especially, it's, it's, a, um, it's a reaction that is just so close to our hearts that, um, that we do take action actually in ways that we might not otherwise. And that was certainly the case with these women and anti-slavery. Um, do we know whether the female anti-slavery society ended after the Civil War or did it take new form? Yes, it took new form and it went into suffrage. A lot of the women who were involved um, with anti-slavery had um, learned how to organize, basically. They learned that they could make money off um, their collars and their cups and their sachets and all the things that, that women made in their sewing circles. Uh, and they began to commercialize those a little bit more and they began to work for the suffrage organizations that then began to take over. Uh, uh, and they, and of course, um, there were a whole other group of women, more strident, who spoke forth. They were younger, they, um, they, they had voices, began to um, actually speak out in public. Uh, so these women um, would, have stayed, would have stayed in their community and they probably wouldn't have joined those more Oh, those, those groups that were more radical, they felt, or more out front. I think these were um, a lot of the women in the group uh, that Sarah Sol Wilbur and, and Abby Maria Wilbur um, were with, uh, who me were members with, would have um, faded a little bit into the background and become, you know, regular women, women who played the right role in society. It, it was not comfortable to be a radical in a small community, as anyone would know. Um, Helen, as more of a comment, said that Francis Palmer Richmond was a congregational church member, but talked about attending programs at the Methodist Church, so there seemed to have been some crossover. Did you see that also, Janet? Absolutely. The Methodist Church was a, um, because, uh, because they had so many speakers coming in, there were many circuit riders, um, Methodist circuit riders who came in and spoke on all manner of things. Um, they, they, um, you know, they spoke about drinking, they spoke about you know, home abuse, they spoke about philosophy, in they came, and everybody in the community went to the Methodist Church to hear these, these wonderful speakers. The Congregational Church was more doctrinaire. They, um, you know, the, there was one minister there, he lived in the community, the Methodist ministers really revolved every year or two, a new, a new one would come in, um, and that minister often became the heart of the, of the community, and was very involved with education, with schools, and educating young people. It was a different role that the ministers of those two churches had, and the churches served different purposes in the community. Excellent. Um, are there records from the Female Anti-Slavery Society, or have you gathered information here and there, such as from the name, uh, the list of names and individual family histories? There's, no, there's not much, I can tell you. There's not much of a record. Maybe Marjorie will come up with some amazing thing from the archives, but um, 1830s, 1840s, it's, uh, it's very far back. And not even, um, you know, many newspapers exist um, in our archives from that time. So we can't tell what's going on, really. We do have, you know, the Liberator and, and various, um, uh, you know, propaganda uh, pamphlets that have been preserved over the years. But... Um, no, as, in terms of the local community, these were, as that, as that, that woman who wrote the, um, the book on the 1830s, and I should give you her name again, because she is, she's written, a, she's a really wonderful writer. Um, her name is Julie, Julie Joy Jeffrey. Jeffrey, Julie Joy Jeffrey, and the name of her book is The Great Silent Army of Abolition, Abolitionism. And it's true that these women Really, um, we knew nothing about them. We, we, the only thing we had were their names. And we only by reading between the lines and Sarah Sol Wilbur's journal and a few letters did we begin to be able to piece together what had happened here and how, how helpful they were um, as a cadre, a, an invisible cadre back in those days. Um, Mimi Whitmarsh added to the book recommendations, if, you're, if you were interested by this topic, um, there's a wonderful book about the women of Nantucket at this time that were meeting about the same topics called Ahab's Wife um, by, I think, Sina Jeter Nasland is the name. Um, so if you if you'd like this presentation, that may be also of interest to you. 
All right. I think we are running out of questions. So thank you, Janet. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> So, Janet, thank you so much for all the time and energy you put into preparing. We appreciate it. I love the topic. Thank you. Mm -hmm.